Welcome everyone, uh, Urban Forestry Commission, Northampton Urban Forestry Commission meeting, June 15th, 2022. Uh, I do not see anyone here from the public, so we can dispense with public comment. Um, I sent you the minutes uh, that Deb so nicely put together for us yesterday. I don't know if you had time to read them. Um, if you didn't, um, take time to read them. If you've all read them, then we can uh, make a motion. So whatever is your pleasure. <clears throat> and Sue, I made you the co-host just in case for some reason I'm at home and I don't usually Zoom from home and my computer sometimes acts finicky here. So if I happen to disappear, you're in charge. Okay, will it just default to me or do I have to do anything? No, you're the co-host. So if I happen okay. to blink out, you can just run the meeting. Okie so doke, will do. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> All right. Um, I had a question on the minutes. Sure. Um, that one about um, the third item down on the chair report. Yes. Is let that me, is that that doesn't make sense to me. All right. Let, hold on a second. Let me just. Uh, I'm just going to disappear for a second. I got to find them. Hold on. Uh, let's see. It's probably instead of a two car accident, it's probably supposed to be two for two car accidents. Yes, thank you. Oh. Yep. Yep. So they were at, they were damaged by the accident, not by the snowstorm. That, right, that that is correct. So we were okay. we were able to um, get a credit from the insurance company of both okay. the vehicle the uh, motor vehicle accident folks, unfortunately. <laughs> There's a teensy typo. Currently, there are no public sh shade tree hearing needs an S hearings, plural. Thank you. Teeny tiny. You do a great job, Deb. No. Please, Deb yeah, I'm pushing. Sorry. Yeah, no, sure please do. Please tell me. Okay. I'll make a motion to accept the minutes as as edited. I'll second. Thank you. Um, any discussion on the motion? Great. No, no discussion. Deb, can a roll call vote, please? Gladly. Rich? Uh, yes. Jen? Yes. Susan? Yes. Marilyn? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> David? Yes. And Molly? Yes. All right. Uh, okay, so uh, let's see. Chair, uh, chair report. Um, so I, I don't know if any, all of any of you have seen the Gazette, you probably have, or maybe some other news outlet that Wayne Fiden is retiring um, as of June 30th. So um, I have been in contact with Carolyn Mish uh, in regards to the STO. So I am, she really honestly told me she wouldn't be able to review it probably until um, the transition is over, which would be uh, when Wayne is gone. Uh, so the next, this past period, since I guess Wayne's retirement has been pending and they've been kind of working together in the transition. I think after July, um, Carolyn was going to make time to review the whole STO. Uh, also in the interim, I um, have reached out to George Kohut to try to uh, set up a meeting to either meet with him in person or in Zoom to uh, discuss the, the draft STO as well. So we can be working um, with this from both ends um, of the spectrum. 
And who's George Cohead again? Oh, I'm sorry. I, my, my apologies. He's the chair of the uh, planning planning board. That's what I thought. Thank you. And also, he's a Wednesday regular tree planter too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Part yeah, of yeah. the gang. Okay. You've met him. You've probably yeah, planted yeah, with yeah, him. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure I have. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I want to mention to you, and I will try to do it this way because I, I don't have multiple screens anymore. So if I open something up, you all disappear. So it drives me crazy. So did anyone see the Daily Hampshire Gazette? There was a letter to the editor from Jackie Balance. Mm. Has it not been published? I yet? don't think so. When it, was it? Um, it was sent on the 12th. So I, um, it's a little bit of a challenge regarding regarding Carolyn Mish. No, no, that was someone else. Um, okay. There. What was it about? It was about um, challenging um, city, the city in essence, city government and city boards, and particularly the UFC, to um, strengthen um, tree ordinances. Uh, oh, I didn't see it. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. Let me. Um, I, if you if you don't mind, I have it. I'll, I want to read it to you, and then I'll, I'll yeah I'll yeah please read it to you. Um, so you have a version that hasn't been to the Gazette because I read pretty closely. Yes, yeah, so I have a version, and when I'm okay. done reading it, I'll forward it to you all so you can see it. It's addressed to uh, it's addressed to the mayor, myself, Sue. You have it in your Verizon email. Uh oh, Lily, Brian Steele, and Laura Krutzler. So um, the title of it is. Um, well, hold on a second, sorry. On behalf of, of some good old trees, uh, open letter to the Northampton Urban Forestry Commission. Hmm. Um, in the Daily Hampshire Gazette on June 6th, Darcy Sweeney underlined the vital importance of protections for our state forest. I would like to add a word as uh, well for our urban forest, Northampton's own tree, ca tree canopy. Our dedicated Urban Forestry Commission does what city planners allow including planting a variety of young trees along our streets for future shade and beauty. While we plant new trees, it behooves us to save healthy mature trees, the workhorses of carbon sequestration. Today, I, I saw a spotted fawn in my backyard in Bay State Village, uh, a sacred moment made possible because our neighborhood still has small bits of forested corridors and a habitat for wildlife. Deer, bear, foxes, et cetera, live here because the Bay State is 80% surrounded by water, the Mill River and Broughton's Creek that provide water, trees, and wildlife, paradise. Unfortunately, the major infill developments underway in the city, in the Bay State and Montview neighborhoods right now, involve the cutting of many healthy old trees whose real air, air scrubbers we need to trade our carbon for their oxygen. At 39 Landy Avenue, there are 11 living Norway spruces about to be felled along with several mature deciduous trees. Those spruce trees along, alone represent uh, more than a thousand years of carbon sequestration. I didn't fact check that. I don't know that for sure, but this is how it's written. There are irreplaceable, they are irreplaceable over many generations to come. This lot is on the very edge of the Mill River watershed. When will we know uh, when will we know what we've cut too? When when will it? Let's see. Sorry. When will we know that we've cut too many trees for a healthy ecosystem? When it's too late? I sat in on some on some urban forestry commission meetings last year. I remember discussions about proposing stronger tree protections. As a lifelong oxygen addict, I appreciate <laughs> the contribution ah! made, uh, a contribution trees make to every breath, their beauty in all seasons and in the many other life forms they support. Stronger tree protections by themselves would mitigate some of the more egregious examples of inappropriate infill threatening neighborhoods across the city. I want to ask our friends and neighbors on the Urban Forestry Commission, please tell the public what we can do to support stronger tree protection ordinances. Sure. So, oh, Jackie, as a matter of fact, Jackie is right here. Okay. Oh, ah. So, um, so that was sent to me on uh, over the weekend. Hi, Jackie. Hello, Jackie. We were your ears must be burning. We were just talking about you. If you wanna, if you wanna unmute your uh, your microphone. 
Thank you. I, I sent a letter to the editor of the Gazette and I copied Rich and uh, Susan and the city council. And actually the um, Gazette was going to put it in today's paper, but I, I they said they'd hold it because there's something else I want to send in sooner. However, I think it's time for stricter tree protections in the city. I think there's widespread support for it. And with the changes at uh, planning and sustainability, this might be the time. I hope, I hope, I hope. Anything that, any message that you want me to take back to my people, how we can help support stronger pre tree protections. I know there's the, the Tree Northampton people and Lily Lombard and those people who work so hard, God bless them. But this is a fresh new bunch that would like to get on board coming from a different angle yeah, yeah, yeah. from infill. Yeah, yeah. Infill is killing our trees. Jackie, do you know why those no, those spruce are being removed? Is it for development? Oh, yes. It's for development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, John Hansel yeah. once so, took, just demolished a single, an old single family home. And now the rumor is he, he, he could be allowed to put three duplexes on that same property. And it's on the edge of the Mill River wetlands. It's, it's, a, it's a crime. So it, what can the people do to, to help you all get stricter tree protections? I know you, you've wanted to for some time. So I, I might just chime in for a second. I, I think one of the ways that people can help us is that you, you've been following us um, in regards to the significant tree ordinance, which um, applies to site plan review and special permit that is approved by the planning board. We have done our due diligence with that ordinance and now it's going to um, planning and sustainability and the planning board members for them to review. Um, this, the ordinance or the tree protections that you're just talking about really pertain to what we call by right protection. Yeah. Um, so I know it's a, um, it is a little more complicated because there it's by right development is allowed under MGL. Um, and I personally think that the way that we could tackle this is to actually have the city planning, the city planning board and maybe the city council create some kind of uh, working subgroup or sub or, or committee that actually reviews how infill development has impacted the different neighborhoods throughout the city and uh, what the ramifications uh, of that development has been, you know, trees being one of them. Um, because I think it's it's big it, one. I think it's a big one, but I also think there's other infill issues um, mm -hmm. that probably should be addressed all at the same time. So the, the question mm -hmm. is that you know, because if we were to try to create an ordinance that would protect private shade trees, that would be really complicated. Not it's not something that I'm it's something I'm interested in looking into. I just don't know um, how we would go about it. But I think if it, if it was if it wasn't by right, if it had to go for site plan review, would then would would some tree ordinances then come into play? Yes. Okay. Yes, but because of the the way that the zoning, the state zoning regulations are, the type of uh, infill development that Northampton is seeing, it's allowed. Um, basically, the city has a home rule petition. The city voted to exercise its right to um, follow the state guidelines for this type of development. So this is this is what we have, unfortunately. I mean, I, I don't personally think anyone anticipated that, um, you know, this would be the end result of what's like seven years ago. So I, I really think it needs to be looked at um, in such a way that it addresses not only the tree issue, but it, it, it addresses everyone's concerns. Um, and and looks does a look back period as to what the impact has been. Um, I, I, I'm happy to have that conversation yeah. with uh, with anyone, and I'd be more than happy to be part of the process. Uh, I'm, as I'm sure as many of the other commissioners would probably feel the same way, but I don't want to speak for them all. Can I jump in and just kind of recap, Jackie? I don't know if it was clear. We've been the commission's been working on a revise an amendment for amending the tree protections in the significant tree ordinance. And that's gone to the planning department. So, so anyone involved in 
planning and the city to support that process would be great. And then what Rich is saying is that it's, if I'm, now this is part I'm gonna ask for clarifications. Seven years ago, when the zoning was changed, the city, if, you're, if I'm understanding correctly, agreed to go by the Massachusetts general law regarding the zoning? Yeah, so, so there, 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 are state, there are state building codes, state building regulations uh, that we, every community in Massachusetts follows. So Massachusetts allows this type of infill development along, as long as the community um, adopts their own local zoning ordinance. So in order to facilitate um, a greater housing density, um, you know, smaller footprint, quote unquote, of, of the building, uh, you know, people have, being, have the ability to walk, ride their bikes, be closer to uh, the, uh, the downtown areas yeah. of Lawrence, Leeds and Northampton, they adopted um, the this zoning regulation by right. It's, it's not really, it's, it's, it's not really called infill development. It's just by right construction. Mm -hmm. I understood. So, yeah. So, I mean, and it's really, and by right construction, you know, one of the other things too that that is also tricky is that what right now, Jackie, if you or I wanted to go get a building permit and put an addition on our house and we went to the building department and we could get we could get a permit to put an addition. And if there was a large sugar maple next to your house, you and I could both just cut it down because there's zero tree protection uh, for private shade trees of that nature. So the infill development no. is is similar to that. Um, and that's kind of a it's kind of a slippery slope in essence because what you're trying to do is you're you're saying we want to regulate the infill development or we want to try to find a way to mitigate the loss of these trees, but then it opens up a much broader. I think it opens it up a little wider because now you're saying, well, what about people that can just get a building permit to put an addition? What about people that can get a permit to build a swimming pool in their backyard? Okay, you know, so I, it, it's. It's an important conversation to have. We have to have it. We have to start having it, um, you know. But I think there's there's um, there's going to be all kinds of little tentacles. But I, I thank you, thank you, Rich. I understand everything you're saying, and I appreciate your time and trouble. I don't need to take no, any no, more of the no commission's time, except for a quick question: When is your new ordinance going to show up at the planning board so people can? stand up for it is um, it is on the schedule no i we don't we're not that far yet we just finished it last month we finalized it last month and now that wayne's retiring there's a transition period that's going on in the office so uh I'm, we're hoping to or i'm hoping to meet with carolyn uh in the beginning of uh or have a phone conversation um in the beginning of july and then also uh, speak with uh, the planning board chair, George Kohut, about it as well. Okay. And so I can just keep looking at the yep. city calendar and see when it's on the agenda. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And, I, and I, you know, there is definitely a change from what I can hear from the planning board members. They are really interested in trying to protect trees um, and strengthening tree protection ordinances or, or strengthening the tree protection of trees in general. Um, that was relayed to me. Now, what that exactly means, I don't really know. Um, you know, so I have to take it at face value. Mm. But we'll... I heard Jim Nash say something about that yeah. last night on a Ward Three meeting. Yeah. So I mean, it's definitely there's definitely a lot of sentiment and a lot of groundswell amongst regular residents and also elected um, and appointed officials in the city that want to try to do this. It's just a matter of how do we start the conversation and where do we start from, I guess. And so by, by trying to redraft and make it, it edits to the STO, that's a first step in one part of the zoning, um, uh, zoning regulations within the city. Now it's the other part, the pieces of the puzzle, which is the by right development that's allowed, that has to be looked at. Um, right. Yes. So sorry to take up a bunch of time, folks, but. Thank you all very much for the it's work important. that you do. Yeah, Jackie. I, also, I read. I read your. Um, um, I read your email um, that you sent to us to the whole commission right before you joined. Oh yeah, I, I figured I just, that out. <laughs> I just forwarded them uh, 
um, a, a, co a copy of the email. Um, are y'all are y'all oxygen addicts also? <laughs> that was my decade. favorite line. Oxygen addict. That was my favorite line. And I really, I would say for as a commissioner and as a person who's been in this industry, I really appreciate you and your community members, you know, standing up and talking about this because uh, we all know that when those really big trees exist, you know, for first little, we did not have as much pavement. We did not have as much heat. We did, you know, not we're talking people. cobblestone streets or dirt and, you know, it's, it, it's you know putting a new tree in it's not going to look if, if they even make it to the you know to those big size so it'll take generations you. if climate right. change thank doesn't you. get them first yeah so the so um rich from his sort of point of view having experience with the city and the uh, the ordinances is suggesting that there a group come together and i'm not sure exactly who would spearhead that and he offered to to participate to look at not just the trees, but other issues involved in what what has been happening. I will, I, I can loop Rich into the next, the last infiltrators, that's what we call ourselves now, the infiltrators. <laughs> um, uh, we just started, we had two little meetings. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a copy of the, the notes from yesterday's meeting, last night's meeting. We met at, um, Mainsfield on a picnic table under this huge tree that was like an amphitheater. Mm. So, love those trees. Yeah. Love yeah. the work you guys do. I know you work hard for 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 little little praise and reward. There's some big sycamores there by those picnic tables. Oh, I guess that's what it was. It was enormous. Yeah. I can't, I don't recognize all the trees by oh. their names. Sometimes a bark or a leaf or a, a fruit will tell me who it is, but. They were great advocates of people learning about them so that they do see them as for how important. But thank you, Jackie. And thank you're you. welcome to share the notes with me. I, I'm curious. Okay, I don't I'll know copy, how I'll copy I can both help. of them. And I will I will leave you to your agenda. Thank you so much for making me feel so welcome. Thanks for coming. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Peace. Um uh, fellow commissioners, I just out of order. So there's a David David uh Rabinovitz is here. He's a uh, David, if you want to show your there you are. So David. David is a uh, inter is a interning with uh, with me and the the uh, forestry division for a couple of months this summer. So David and I have a connection because we were in a University Without Walls class um, this past semester and the semester before that. Um, so David is um, trying to um, trying to trying to kind of get his feet wet a little bit in the in the um, I guess in the operational end of things, if you want to say so, um, David, feel free to speak. Um, or, oh, or, yeah. yeah. So um, I'm uh, retired from my main career in um, film production for about 40 years and uh, decided I wanted to do something to give back and uh, consider climate change. And uh, I heard about this uh, arboriculture college certificate that Christina Besenson was advocating at UMass. And uh, I, in fact, I, re I read about her in the New York Times Magazine a, uh, about a year and a half ago, when they were talking about the need for arborists in America now. There's such an incredible shortage of people that have a knowledge of trees. So I thought, there's something I could get into. And uh, I'm Started on the program, met Rich. I think Rich, you've been in two or three of my classes uh, in the past year and, or two. Anyway, uh, I got one more class to go to get the certificate and probably study for the ISA certification or something like that. And then I don't know where I'll go from there, but I'm trying to suck up as much information as I can. <laughs> and uh, Rich was kind enough to take me on for the summer. So that's me. Thank you for choosing the internship with the city. Yeah, I, I promise I won't work them too hard. <laughs> Rich is an awesome guy, but you guys already know that. 
<laughs> it's great that he has some help. Yes, that is yes, and and help that is motivated and interested in and in, uh, in sort of like it's like working with volunteers. They're very motivated, very interested in what we're doing, and it makes a big difference, um, personally and professional to me. Uh, to me. Um, Okay, sorry, Marilyn, I apologize. I don't think there's been any meeting since I've been the chair that I've actually run on time. So I am really sorry. And there is no exception, including your last meeting. So enjoy it while you can. You can just tell me I'm never on time, okay? I'm sorry. All right, so I have two more things in my chair, in my tree warden report. One is that um, I went last Wednesday and uh, on behalf of the city received our Tree City USA Award for 2021. Um, and we also got which 15 years in a running now, which is excellent. And we also received our sixth in a row growth award, which is a, which is an accomplishment uh, in itself. Yeah. All thanks to all of you, um, the Tree Northampton folks, uh, Rob, who's not here, um, and you know the two different administrations that we both have served so far under this initiative. So it's been it's been great. Um, and the other um, item is, is that I have to have a public shade tree hearing for, uh, let me find my phone, I think four, four or five trees on River Road. So National Grid has a, um, what they call a cross country utility line. There are actually six trees. They have a cross country utility line that runs um, <clears throat> from where the, former uh, Hampshire County, um, used to call it the sanatorium, but it's now, I think it's another long-term care facility. There's a cross country line that comes up River Road and then goes into the woods. And then it actually goes up and over through Highview is the name of the place. And then it comes back down onto River Road right before Williamsburg. So that line and that utility poles that are in the woods are failing. So they have requested, um, to install about six new utility poles um, on River Road on the left-hand side. So if you're going to Williamsburg, they're on the left-hand side, right next to that large uh, rock outcropping. So all the trees that are there are all trees that are actually growing out of the rocks. They are not what I would consider like a freestanding public shade tree in a tree belt. Um, and um, there's a four inch, there's two four inch American beaches. There's one eight inch ash, a one three inch ash, one eight inch elm and one four inch black birch. So I'll be putting that together and probably advertising it, not next week, but the week after. And then the hearing will probably be at the end of June, beginning of July, just so you're aware of it. Um, and they will, they will pay mitigation for the loss of the trees. So there's no issue with that. Uh, and that way there it gets, that is the feeder line for Williamsburg. So if that line goes down, um, regular utility crews that we would see like in our neighborhood can't repair this line. They have to wait and bring someone else in to another part of the state because they actually have to get in with all-terrain vehicles to reach these poles, which are very short and very old. They've been in there since probably the 60s. So, and that is all I have at the moment. Anyone have any questions? No. Okay. It's Actually, I have a question, Rich. Yes. Um, when you went to the um, Tree City event last week, yes, were there were there many uh, municipalities either attending for the first time as Tree City, or the were did has there been an uptick in growth awards? Um, to answer your first question, there was only one new municipality that was awarded Tree City USA this past year. I don't have the flyer with me until my desk at work. Uh, and then um, there weren't a lot of people in attendance. Um, and I don't really know why, I, but I mean, it was nice. It was outside at a park, et cetera. Uh, there was an, another uh, tree campus USA. So there's like Smith College's Tree Campus USA. There was one other school and I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. Um, and I'd have to say probably not since the 
the pandemic kind of stopped a lot, you know, slowed things down quite a bit. Um, and I think there's only been maybe one or two communities that have, have been added on in the last two or three years, which is unfortunate because Tree City USA is a, a requirement for any municipality to apply for any of the community challenge grants that are offered by DCR. Mm. So that is a real sticking point for a community that doesn't have, um, you know, funding available. And there's more the U.S. Forest Service. I talked to Julie Coop today. U.S. Forest Service has has really rolled out a large pot of money for tree planting projects throughout the country. And you know, Massachusetts is a beneficiary of that. And Julie manages all that funding. So it's not just your it's not just for grants for like inventories or wood bank or um, you know, uh, EJ grant. Um, although there are more grants for EJ plus just regular planting, uh, tree planting um, that folks can apply for. So, you know, I, you know, I, I don't know. It's, I think it will go, it'll swing back the other way. It'll just take time, like everything else. So. And does that mean that any town that is in it has a better chance of getting a grant? Um, no, the, the tree city USA is just a requirement. So I think the what ways for the grant approvals is really the project itself. Mm. You know, it's not necessarily the, you know, so I mean, I think we, I mean, this is something we should need to discuss probably at a future meeting, I'll put it on the agenda, but I'd like to, I'd like us to think about looking at um, a grant uh, intent to apply to see if we could actually um, update our tree inventory professionally. Um, but that's a conversation for another meeting and using a DCR grant, or if there's other grant opportunities that you'd like to pursue, we, we should have, we should have a discussion at a future meeting. So did you mention deadlines? Uh, de so the, the uh, intent to apply, the letter has to be on October 1st. Okay. And the uh, actual grant application in, in completed has to be sent to DCR no later than November 1st. Well, one, one reason I was wondering is um, I, I know that the tree commission here in Northampton has a lot going on, a lot on our plate that, that we've been trying to accomplish. Um, but one thing I always love to see with any organization, uh, paid staff or volunteer is when a certain level of success or achievement is reached, how can we help others you know, welcome them into the fold and assist them. Because I feel like Northampton has been a model uh, thanks to Rich and our commission and um, Tree Northampton, it's been tremendous. And, and I bet a lot of other municipalities either are looking our way or, or could be beneficiaries of our input or assistance. And I was wondering if there was any way without adding too much more to the plate, if there's a way that perhaps the commission could take on um, kind of an outreach. I'll jump in. Um, there've been a number of tree programs Rich has been mentoring over the years. And um, I don't know if it's mentoring, it's kind of back and forth with Amherst. We've had a reciprocal relationship and- um, Plainfield. Plainfield, um, is it Gardner? You mentored? No, I, well, I've been working with um, Sarah Greenleaf in East Hampton. Uh huh. Trying to develop a rapport uh, with her um, because we're sister communities in a sense. Uh, and who was the young man who got hired to work on that grant for three towns? You worked with him quite a lot. Well, your testimony. Young guy. That was in Adams or North Adams. North Adams? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, you sure you got the right tree warden? I don't. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. You. You, uh, you went out and helped plant. It was a couple of years ago. Yeah. Over the years, Marilyn, yeah. I don't know if it's, if there's any, obviously there's no list of documentation, but. Um. Well, I know that the, the ones that you mentioned, I'm aware of, but anyway, you know, here we are facing accelerating climate change and um, we're all trying to keep up as best we can with all of our individual yeah. and collective efforts. But different models that I've used in different jobs, I, like one model I was wondering is, is like, you know, there's 14 counties in our state. 
is there at least one municipality in each of the four counties who is sort of kind of an all-star uh, Tree City USA um, recipient? And if so, maybe, I mean, this is, this is kind of on a tangent, but um, maybe that could sort of be a subgroup that works together to try to, like imagine if, if like the whole state just sort of grew through the through an effort that was maybe county oriented like who in our county could we help um and who in like franklin county is doing this and who could they help anyway it's just the model just a suggestion where is east hampton what county is that that's hampshire Hampshire. that's hampshire okay yep. anyway there's all sorts of ways to do things but um as we try to ramp up every single thing we're doing we have to find our points of connection and just mm. grow. And I'll, I'll leave it at that, but thanks, Rich. No, thank you, Marilyn. I think it's yeah. a great, I think it's it's sort of, you're, you're really kind of describing like professional networking is really, you know, so that's kind of what I do at, with Mass Tree Wardens and Foresters Association. There's a huge professional network um, of, and some members of, of that, organization work for communities that aren't Tree City USA. Um, but I think as a commission though, I, I I would love to have a meeting, at least to start with, at least a meeting with the, a joint meeting of the Amherst Tree Commission and our Tree Commission, um, because I think it would be just a, a good way to sort of kind of, I mean, we know who Henry Lappin is. We've met Henry, he's been at our meetings multiple times. We've seen, we've met with him in person. But I think it just would be interesting to share information and maybe having a joint meeting is not the right way to do it, but just to kind of better understand what other people are doing and what is success, what is successful and what is not. And then kind of go out into the, as a professional connection uh, to other communities that have tree advocacy groups or just a group of concerned citizens and see if we can help them. Um, you know, I mean, I have to, I have to say that you know, by Lily, Lily chose East Hampton to be a, a, her pilot project for a class she took, and it really turned into something wonderful. Um, you know, and and I, I think that that has really kind of opened up um, some of the uh, folks in the East Hampton government um, their eyes a little bit to the importance of trees. You know, so it's kind of how we got started here. Um, and I think that's a model that works and can be can be used across the state. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I definitely I've always said there's a very there's a loss of a connection between here and North Adams. You know, it's very kind of empty. Uh, if I walk out my back door and go up over the hill, there's I don't even know who the tree warden is over there. So, uh, well, but, one one thing that I find helpful in life personally and professionally is just sort of the strategy of um, you know, being a, a, a leader on a, on a group hike. You know, you're, you're going forward and you gotta make sure everybody's going forward um, and, you're, and you're looking ahead. But I think too often in life, individuals and groups achieve a certain advancement or success and, and, and don't think to look back. Are we leaving anybody behind? And we know culturally, socially, there's a lot of people being left behind, where, whereas there are a lot of people who are advancing. And I, it's just, it's a model that I like to keep in mind as we continue to move ahead with success. Um, can we turn around and think, oh, is, is, is there anybody who'd like to come along um, who might be interested in what we're doing rather than just continuing to march forward and, and keep you know, adding our own accolades it's it's just a model that I think is going to help the whole world keep one eye going forward and one eye looking back so that we're all kind of moving forward together. <laughs> That's lovely, Marilyn. Makes complete sense, Marilyn. Anyone else have any comments? Okay, um, our next agenda item, which we're, you know, obviously we're almost over that time slot but um and uh because i actually don't have the the next agenda item which was the proposed urban forestry budget i can talk a little bit about that but i don't have 
<clears throat> I don't have hard numbers for you because I didn't wasn't able to get the hard numbers from Donna. But anyways, let's go back to the Urban Forestry Commission replacement. So um, as we all know, Marilyn sent us um, a very um, uh, heartfelt email, uh, basically saying to all of us that, you know, given everything that's been going on and, and Marilyn, I'm not going to speak for you, but it really touched me. Um, you're going to be very missed. Uh, so I'm sorry, I don't, I, I, I don't want you to feel uncomfortable talking about your replacement, but we don't have a replacement, by the way, at least that I'm aware of. But I just thought it would be good for us to sort of uh, just think about um, how, um, you know, trying to replace uh, Merrill, you know, fill Maryland's position on the commission. Have anyone had any thoughts? Um, because I, I, I've spoken to Christina Peterson once, um, and I basically we left and left it in such a way that she would contact me. Um, and she was going to give us some thought, and I have not heard from her. So um, I don't, I don't have any uh, contacts. No one has contacted me. Of course, we don't really advertise that someone's leaving the commission. So that's another, that's a whole nother. Um, what set of qualities would benefit the city tree program the most? And strengthen this commission. That's a good question, Sue. I, I'm going to let someone else answer that. <laughs> well, I would answer it, but I want to let someone else answer it. Or just a food for thought, if we can think. I mean, well, maybe one way to go about it is just list out um, the, the kind of skills that you would want on the commission represented by this seven commissioners. Um, exactly. You know, obviously, you need somebody who has knowledge of trees and, um, and, you you also want people who understand um, how to do the, the things that like Todd did with city government and you know having David on as you know the legal aspect and Molly and Jen as amazing like plant um, uh, with great knowledge of plants and Sue you're a great community organizer so in, in some ways I feel like we we have a lot of different areas well covered. Um, so I don't know, anything missing? What do we not have? Or wish, wish that we had more expertise in? I would say maybe, uh, maybe an educator, somebody who could really talk about what, talk about the merits of trees the, and what the, what the commission does. Um, maybe, maybe something like what David does, a, a media, sorry, somebody who specializes in communication, film, you know, getting the word out. Hmm. What did you start to say, Molly? Um, no, I was just saying what, asking the question. Oh. What, what skills would we like to have that we don't have? I think one of the limitations with the, with the getting the word out has always been the fact that as a commission, everything goes, has, anything that goes out has to go through the mayor. That's why we formed Tree Northampton, so we could do a little mm. bit more with communication. Mm. But um, just I don't know if you knew that knew about all that, David. It was interesting what somebody said about Todd. He he did have you know that that government experience. He could whip through ordinance language really fast. Mm. But um, it's always I, great. I, I like the also yeah, to, to have that combination of visionary, like big picture systems thinking, and then like real practical skills. And that combination, I think, um, so, sometimes there can be conflict if, if some people are more thinkers and others are more planners, but I, I, I'm, a, I'm in agreement that you need both. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they and both have to work well together. I, I actually like David's suggestion of someone who's uh, an educator or a little uh, media savvy. Um, mm. I'll be truthful, I don't really have any, there's been no ground rules spelled out since uh, we have a new administration about, you know, about the, 
use of social media and things of that nature. Oh. There hasn't been any change, let's put it that way, but there hasn't been any additional thing. So, you know, I I think we could we could mark, I guess maybe market ourselves. I mean, I'm not a marketing person, believe me, but you know, there's got to be a way to be able to get the message out um, about what we do as a commission. And I think actually having someone who um, has that type of background in it and in the, in the education background could actually assist us. Uh, you know, because or an I, outreach. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if it's so much education as, um, yeah, as communications, mm -hmm. outreach, yeah. like, uh, uh, what's that, like, uh, promotion that, you Could know. Could take a PowerPoint and go to the Rotary Club like Rich does, but, yeah. but Rich doesn't have, we can't clone Rich, unfortunately. <laughs> well, I, I don't think I'd be a very good person marketing <laughs> You oh, you're job? wonderful talking to people. No, no, no. And like, I'd be like, do you want the job or not? You know, you know <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's, I think we have, we have a lot of technical experience on this commission in different fields. Um, and I think having someone who actually had some, a good a the ability to do some kind of outreach. And I, I think we also need to I think I need to figure out what our what our parameters are on on creating outreach of some sort. Uh, you know, because we did the traditional press release this year for our plantings in April through the mayor's office. Um, but as far as anything else, I mean, you know, Tree Northampton did a nice little spread um, with our tree planting projects at the at the at Ryan Road and Jackson Street. You know, it would be nice to actually have the city be able to, you know, that should come from the city as well. So people can actually see the work that we're doing. Um, that, you know, mm. and I, you know, and I don't know. The other thing too is that if, I, if you a while back you read maybe in the paper that the uh, city council was forming a subgroup or working subgroup that had members of the city council and members of the public wanting to try, and this is a, a city council sanctioned committee um, to really better understand why residents um, are not interested in serving on mm. municipal boards and commissions. Um, not I don't, just Northampton, that's going on. It's going, it's right, it's going on everywhere. everywhere. Right, and if anyone has ever attended one of Rick Harper's uh, lectures uh, when he talks about volunteerism uh, in, the, in this country and how volunteerism is really just going, um, you know, the percentage every year is getting smaller and smaller. Was that pre-pandemic? Yeah. That trend was pre-pandemic? Yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, but so so that's a whole nother sub, that's a whole other subject. And I mean, I, I think this commission was trying to look at it for more and I don't want to say not, I'll use the word nuts and bolts, but like, you know, certain commissions meet at um, a time when no one can attend. Um, should, uh, if it's an in-person meeting, should the city or the commission um, have a place to provide childcare, et cetera, things of that nature that would facilitate people being able to serve on these volunteer commissions and boards um, and not feel like they can't do the work because there's no alternative. Um, I mean, Zoom really is an easy platform to operate on, but even 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 some of us have you know personal things that get in the way of that, and we can't attend, et cetera. Um, but I also think it's a level of commitment. There's a huge level of commitment being on this commission. I mean, we've been going on since 2015. 2015, yeah, 2015, two meetings a month, pretty regularly. Like only the city council does that. So, well, Rich, when you and I talked a couple of weeks ago, um, we talked about possibility of discussing once a month. Yeah. And like, I, yeah. Meeting once a month, and then the rest of the month really working on a, a specific project. Yeah, Marilyn and I had a phone conversation uh, because Marilyn unfortunately did not get my email in time and was looking to wanted to know when the meeting was going to start the last time. My my apologies, Marilyn. Um, 
but we had a quick phone conversation and then, you know, we touched on the subject of, of, you know, maybe it would be more attractive for a new commissioner if we only met once a month, you know, and are, and are there any citywide goals for diversity? Um, I a, you know, for that, commissions. Are there any not, not that I've ever seen spelled out in writing metrics that they're looking for? It is. I mean, we are advisory to the mayor, mm -hmm. so I don't know how the mayor has spelled things out in the past. You said there I, really I, isn't anything. No, I, I really, I really don't know. I don't, it's not really even marketed. You know, commission vacancies aren't aren't marketed like they're not, we're not elected positions. We're just, we're appointed, and it's word of mouth. I I think so. Hmm. But I wonder if somebody from one of the universities. Well, it would have to be in Northampton. What about um Gabe? Is it Gabe from Smith College? Not familiar. I don't know who you mean. Who was Gabe? Uh. Maybe her, their full name is Gabrielle. Oh yeah, uh, Gab Gabby Immerman. Yeah. Gabby, yeah. Oh, Immerman, yeah. Um, because Gabby seems to have great knowledge of uh, plants, and um, from my understanding, when I first moved here and got involved with the um, Grow Food Northampton, um, she did a educational program and anyway she just seems like she has good people skills and good teacher and i'm wondering if she might be a good candidate that's a possibility another thing that i thought about actually was seeing if someone on the planning board was interested in serving mm. especially and and especially given the fact that we we there's so much pressure um from residents to look at the you know the zoning ordinance as a whole uh, in regards to uh the, the tree aspect of things right you know you know it's it's not like we have a city councilor on this commission because there's that's not how it's made up um that, that would be like a multi-member commission which is like what energy and sustainability is or transportation and parking but that's that was a thought of mine if we could canvas maybe some of the some of the planning board members mm. it, it might it might help them too it might help us uh, help us all actually but um but i i think i think i think we need to at our next meeting probably need to have a, a good discussion about um whether or not we want to stay two if we want to stay two meetings a month or go to one meeting a month and in, in earnest kind of figure that out maybe before we actually ask someone to commit to our commission i mean that's just another way of doing it as well can we um i think we sh someone should send just a quick bulleted email uh about this agenda item for next time saying you know over the next month think about you know what you know this tiny discussion we've just had what what do we need on the commission that's one thing and then our thoughts on meeting one or two times a month and if there's anything else you know i also think one of the roles that marilyn has served for me anyway is just you know just even the little conversation you just brought up about um, you know, kind of the meta mission, you know, the bigger, the bigger, you've always been organizationally so thoughtful, like stuff I just wouldn't even think of, you know, because that's just not the way my mind sits usually. But, um, and just holding, um, yeah, the larger, the larger climate change um, thoughts and how we can link local to like a bigger picture and and just about um uh within group dynamics kind of like how to 
I remember you doing stuff when we were doing goals and things like that. Like you had a whole method of doing it that was very thoughtful. So, you know, just I don't I don't know what that skill set is called, but um, you know, systems thinking. Ah, there we go. Oh. I knew there had to be something. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, I think that's uh that's a huge strength we're gonna, you know, lose with Maryland stepping down. So well, I told Rich I'd consider staying on if we could meet once a month and if we could meet in person, the twice a month, the Zoom, it's, you know, the, just every, all the challenges of the pandemic, you know, it's just been hard these past couple of years. But yeah, that, that pro, I mean, my, my, my term is up at the end of this month and I just didn't feel like I could commit to another three years if if it was going to continue like this. Why did we decide to keep meeting on Zoom? Just because because we don't have to now, right? No, we don't we don't have to, but then we have to find a venue that can do hybrid. Oh. So we we need to so if we're gonna start meeting in person, I'd actually like to meet um I would like to do that, but I have to find a place that meets hybrid and right now there's only two places city hall hearing room that i'm aware of and maybe i'm not even maybe not i know city council chambers but no none of those uh, commissions are they're not meeting in person why do we have to meet hybrid uh because i because i think that the state is going to the state's going to allow um, the state is reviewing the open meeting law. They are going to allow communities to make the decision as to whether or not they want to meet strictly in person. They want to they want to do a mix and match of both, like um, like we are meeting by Zoom, um, and they're also going to allow the communities to decide whether or not if they go back to in person meeting, whether this the community would um, can also. Uh, do a hybrid mode so people can continue to the, the uh, public access that they would not typically have. So after talking with the mayor, I believe that if we, you know, once the state legislature gets this squared away, which I think is going to happen sometime in July, um, I think the mayor was saying that she probably would want to go to either, you can decide to be in person, but you're going to have to be hybrid or you can be on Zoom um and not meet in person because i i don't think she wants to she doesn't want to limit the public's ability to access these meetings and have public input hmm. so that means uh, the meeting spaces would be at a premium um until it would be able to get um a, 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 enough spaces set up so there can be multiple you know multiple meetings held at different times or at the sorry at the same time um, but in different spaces hmm. So I need to get some clarification on that because I, I think I just confused you all because I just confused myself, but I think that's pretty much the gist of it. I need think, to build out. I think, <laughs> yeah, I think you're gonna see more. I don't think it, this is a unique situation. And I think one of the kind of things that COVID has brought to bear is uh, accessibility, you know, and there's, you know, people who feel that they're still vulnerable for various reasons. Um, there's, you know, uh, there's just a, a much larger awareness about how to meet accessibility needs. You know, we used to think of accessibility just as like a wheelchair ramp or something, but. Um, also, not I, everybody I, can I, jump in a car and drive somewhere exactly. and park and yes. attend in order to be right. part of the political, the conversation. Right, right, right. Okay, so it sounds like with um jen's suggestion that we should probably put together a, a i should probably put together an email with some bulleted points of things for folks to think about for our next meeting to have another discussion about how we go about attracting um someone to be on the commission uh, and what type of person we'd like to have what, what kind of skill set we'd like to see them have um and then really how to I guess how to market it in a sense. Um, Marilyn, you're welcome to come back to that meeting and give us more advice. <laughs> <laughs> Your advice is going to be missed. Um, does anyone uh, does anyone else have any 
I think what I'll do is I'll connect with Sue on that and Sue and I will come up with an email with them. And, it, and please email me if you have any other things that you'd like to discuss about this at our next meeting, okay? Um, anyone else have any comments? Okay. Um, are the proposed uh, FY23 budget. So I'll just briefly give you a quick overview. So we are, um, we are level level funded budget. So we basically have the same monies that were available to us um, this fiscal year that was available to us last fiscal year with the exception of increases for contractual obligations and uh, commodities such as fuel, electricity, um, things of that nature. So we basically, we have the same money to work with in our budget. Uh, we have the same staffing levels in this our division. Um, we have $50,000 for tree planting. We have $49,000 for tree removal for a contract contractor. We have um, $49,000 for an emergency contract for tree removal, which they both have contractors assigned to them probably. And then we have a new contract that we're gonna put together um, for tree trimming. So my goal is to try to get um, trees trimmed on a proper routine pruning cycle. Um, and we're gonna to have to use a contract to help us out with that because I just don't have enough uh, physical staff to do the work. Um, and we still have uh, all the funding available for all the tree planting supplies and sundries that we use. So we, you're, you know, we're financially in, in a good place, you know. Where does the trimming money come from? Does that come out of the planting? No. For the two removal budgets, or is that? No, no, no it's a separate pot of money. It's, it's oh. a separate money that's being allocated within the department. Hmm. So, um, but I think. But I'm, not taken away from somewhere else. No. No. Right. No, I think so. Part of the what's happening is that uh, as many businesses and other municipalities are struggling with uh, finding the appropriate help, we are, you know, we're operationally challenged in that sector at the moment. So we, we're really, we're relying more on uh, contractors to do uh, work um, because the, mm -hmm. a lot of the CDL drivers and people that would normally fill these positions are actually going elsewhere um, in the private sector where there's uh, more, uh, the hourly rate can be adjusted much differently than it can be in a, in a public sector um, positions. So it's definitely nothing I've ever seen in my whole career here. Of course, I think the last two years, no one's, we've never seen any of this. So, I mean, it's just, you know, so we're all living the same thing. It's just impacted, it's impacted things differently. The other thing too, that's impacted our workforce, I believe, and a lot of other public works is the fact that there's a, a huge infrastructure bill that was passed by Congress and the president last, uh, last end of last summer has wicked away a lot of these um, CDL drivers uh, and heavy equipment operators that normally would fill positions in public works departments. So they are actually going and working for private contractors and the benefit packages of uh, these positions are much different than they were when I started. Well, well, probably most of us started our career many years ago. There's benefits are required. It's very different. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole nother challenge in itself. How many vacancies do you have right now? uh off the top of my head uh in our division we have one vacancy so we're doing okay but the other divisions there's quite a few i, I, mm. I don't have an exact number um, and then of course you know you have someone who gets unfortunately hurt on the job they're on a workers comp for a period of time you have a few folks in our department the whole dpw that are retiring so it's it's it's, it's a challenge so but so the, the good news is, though, is that we our core budget is exactly the same. So anybody have any questions? Well, I guess at first I was thinking that was good, but um, it sounds like you don't, you no no admin site help in sight for you. Uh, actually, um, yeah, the ad, we, I believe uh, they were in the process of interviewing for um, a, vac a vacancy in a clerk's position. So, um, and then Beth Willard, Beth Willard has been uh, very helpful from the billing department. So she's uh, helped out um, when needed, when I've had uh, things I uh, 
haven't been able to manage. She's helped out. Uh, Deb has helped out. Uh, Annie's helped out. Um, Linda's helped out. Am I missing anybody, Deb? Cindy's helped out. Beth Capplewood helped out, but she's now gone to the assessor's office. So, yeah. Mm. It's just trying to make it all work. That's all. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of moving parts. But um, any other questions? Okay. Um, future U, uh, UFC um, meeting dates and time. So I put this on the agenda, but I really think what I meant is that we need to just set our meetings for, I wasn't planning on having this big discussion unless you want to about the two meetings per month at this point. But I wanted to put this on here originally because I wanted to just figure out while we're all together, um, the next month's meeting and August meeting. Um, so the, the, the July 20th, which is the second of the, sorry, the, uh, third Wednesday of July and the third Wednesday of August, the 17th are the two meetings that I can attend. And I wasn't sure if folks were on vacation. Some of you responded to me. Thank you. I appreciate it. I can. I can do both of those. Molly can do both. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what? It was July twentieth uh, and yes. August seventeenth. Yes. Um, I I'm not. I'm pretty sure I can do the twentieth. I I just things are so much in flux right now. I'm not. I there's a high chance I could do the seventeenth too, but the twentieth is looking pretty good because we're just going to be coming back from a vacation so okay all right Any, anyone else i'm rob's not here but i i can reach out to him by phone at some point what's the quorum that we need four uh-huh Even though, even though Marilyn's not a commission member, even though, I'm sorry, Marilyn, even though your position would be vacant, excuse me, um, we still need to have a quorum of four. Because mm -hmm. the whole commission is made up of seven. We need one more person to commit to both in order to schedule them. We can start with the 20th, though. Okay. All right. Sounds so like we have a quorum for that, right? Yep. Unless something changes. Yeah, and if something does change, you just got to just reach out to me via email. But we'll start with the 20th of July and then um, August 17th. If we can't make a quorum, then we'll, we'll figure something else out. Shouldn't we know with the people that are here now whether we can make the quorum? Well, so, so July, we have Molly, Jen, right? July, mm -hmm. um, Sue. Mm -hmm myself so that's a quorum david are you available uh i i i don't know about july august 17th i can commit to okay so august 17th i have uh david molly all right mm -hmm. and sue are you are you available yep. Okay. yep and so unless something changes for those different groups okay we should be able to do those too and then and then jen you said maybe the maybe the 17th yeah it's just i mean yeah we just don't know quite what we're doing that's yet. fine that's fine yeah. we'll have a quorum i think and then rob you know rob's the rob's the uh extra, extra yeah the extra yeah. he's a wild card he's a wild card <laughs> so okay all right so we'll so Okay. Anybody have any questions about that? So I guess basically at our next meeting, we'll, pro we'll probably have a pretty detailed discussion about um, our, you know, the next uh, filling the Maryland's vacancy. Right. And then really talking about um, kind of deep diving into the two, you know, twice, twice a month versus once a month. 
And then if anyone else wants to discuss anything else at those meetings, other than our normal things that are plugged in there, just send, you can send me an email. Um, Molly, do you, okay. do you have a spot? Um, I don't have a report, but I would like to um, just open this up for discussion as far as um, what we might do with the information that I'm in the process of collecting. Um, is there anything that we really, that is it really going to be helpful or not to know? Basically, I want to find out where the Elanthus trees are that we have to number one, um, have an idea of how big of a problem it might be. And two, uh, um, to know where specific trees are, maybe would be useful if there's some way that we can do some kind of preemptive or postemptive actions. Um, so as far as I know, I mean, last time I checked there, there weren't any actual, um, like things that you can actually do except to preserve individual trees. You know, you can use certain trees as, um, trap trees and, um, uh, let, let the, um, you know, if you cut down a whole bunch of Alanthus and then save a few that would attract the insects, then then you treat that tree with chemicals and kill those insects. You know, there's one route that you can take, but because of that by right tree cutting thing, you know, unless we can, once we find out where the trees are, you know, some of them are on people's private property and we'd have to, you know, convince them to cut the trees down if that's even what makes sense to do. Mm -hmm. um, there may be things that we could do to at least remove some of the, you know, smaller Alanthus so it doesn't spread. Um, Are you saying that like by eliminating a lot of the Alanthus trees, you're lessening the, uh, the, availability um, of places they can breed is that well their preferred breeding i mean they they think as they might go to some other tree too but what my thinking is if um and i don't think this has been tested out or anything but since alanthus is their preferred tree if it's a community that doesn't have very much alanthus maybe they'll kind of skip over us and go to some place that has more alanthus trees but on the other hand they could just go to other trees that they use like what are they? There's a lot of, oh, a black walnut is some of them. Um, they also feed on grapes. Um, I forget what all the other trees are, but yeah, Elanthus are not the only ones. So it's yet to be seen what would happen if there aren't any Elanthus. So I'm just wondering if people have any thoughts about. Do you want to, I mean, I went out with you once. It was incredibly helpful, but I still don't feel very proficient at it. How would you, if like, theoretically, if you, um, hypothetically, if you wanted to get the public involved and scale up, mm -hmm. is there a good strategy, like the times of year when even a dummy can <laughs> figure out which tree it is? I can't tell them from the nut trees. Well. Um, if it's a female, you definitely could because they have the flowers um, at a certain time of year. I have to look up exactly when that is, but it's probably pretty soon. The males, you can't tell. I mean, you can tell by looking at them if you know what you're looking at. Um, we don't want people to go out and chop down all the nut trees either. Right, exactly. No, we don't want people to go down and chop anything until we make sure what it is. But even, even that's strategy is that even what we want to do is like chop them down I don't does anybody know anything else Rich have you heard anything new from DEM about or DC about um how they're no. actually planning to manage for the land no. no yeah um no. I guess I could still do more you know again try to make a call to somebody I forget who I was going to call Rick Carter what did he know? Hmm. Would Christina Bizanza know? 
Um, you would probably like want to talk to somebody like Tony Simisky at the extension. Who? Uh, Tony Simisky. I can reach out to her. She's um, the entomologist at the extension lab at University of Massachusetts. That would be great. Or I could call her. Yeah, um, that I'll, sounds perfect. Yeah, it would be nice to know like what Apologist. what could we even do mm -hmm. on a citywide scale. I mean, I think just knowing where they are to begin with is really helpful um, because then at least you've created a little sub inventory of the big inventory of all the trees we have, but you're also inventorying trees on private property. Right. Next right. thing I think would be important would be to educate the people that actually own these trees. Yeah. What the spotter lantern fly really is because I don't think people actually pay much attention to it until it's like in their backyard. Right. Um, and I'll give you an example. There's a there's a, a, a lantus tree that is probably pretty close to being dead. It's on, on Orchard Street. It's mm. Orchard Street Cemetery. I'm going to go over and um, offer uh, to talk to the resident about the tree and kind of figure out what we can do about it because its dead branches are hanging over the cemetery. Mm. So, you know, I, I think really... I think we need to know exactly what the what is the management practice, what's the best management practice to deal with this issue, but still collecting right. data and just making people aware of the fact that this is coming or it's already here and we just don't see it is really important because they only they do damage to all kinds of fruit, all kinds of, uh, of uh, fruit trees and, and uh, grapes and, and everything. Right. They're, they're really a mess. And then well, I think. If, what we don't really know is though if we if we let's say we did get rid of the Atlantis or most of it, would that just put more pressure on those other trees? <laughs> well, I think you know that that's a good question. I mean, that's like a big like management question. Like what what's the best management strategy? Is the best management strategy to cut every single Atlantis down, or is it to cut half of them down and leave the other ones as bait trees, and so you can actually then exterminate them as they show up? Um, and again, right. not putting undue pressure on other plant material. Mm -hmm. Those are questions that I don't have readily uh, answers uh, that are readily available at the moment. Right. But I think I'm going to call Tawny and or I'll send her an email and right. I'll speak to her with that. And then I think we should continue to inventory yeah. Nantes trees. Um, I think it, so it is, hopefully it will be useful just well, have I mean, that information. But we don't know how I, exactly. I think it is just for the simple fact that if you go on, if you go to someone's house and you say, "Hey, you know, you know, hi, I'm from mm -hmm. the Forestry Commission. I want to let you know about spider lanternfly because you have that big Atlantis tree in your backyard. You've you've been successful. You've yeah. Been, hopefully, they're listening to you, but you've been successful in communicating with them. Mm -hmm. Well, they could be um, like lookouts. We could I could give them a little card about spotted lanternfly. Yeah. And say, just keep your eyes open for this, and let us know if you see it. Yep. Yep. I, I think that's important. It's again that edu that um, communication slash educational narrative that we're always trying to. Um... I I guess I have a question about like the overall. What has happened in areas where the Atlantis has come in? What what is the problem and the danger to communicate to people? Well, you mean where the where the spotted lantern fly has come in? Like what is the um what the, is the problem we're addressing? Like the first step in okay, there anybody wants couple, to know it's that like right. Well, one there's a couple yeah. different problems. One is that they are um that they devour other things that are crops like grapes and fruit trees and other, you know, shade trees. Like do they come um, in and devour and then move on or do they keep doing it to um, kill the trees? I don't know, good question. Is but it like, uh, what are they called, the moths? Oh, the gypsy moths? moths? You, no, there's a new name now. Oh. Yeah. Is that derogatory? Wooly or something. Wooly. Oh, there's a new name for? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What is it? I can't remember. Oh, it's my like brother wooly, told me. Wooly moth or like. Oh. That's anyway, you guys they don't decimate. I mean, they come in, they do, you know, the leaves disappear and then but the leaves, the trees don't die. That's what I'm just yeah. about defining the problem. Right. 
I'm well, not saying another problem. I was like, okay. how do we define it? Another problem is that they can amass huge numbers of these insects that are um, like literally like cover the entire surface and they yeah, um, gross. Yeah, yeah, it's really, really gross. <laughs> gross a big factor. problem. And they they secrete their honeydew that falls down on anything below. And then the, um, and then the honeydew gets moldy so it can grow like black mold and things. So it's it's an aesthetic problem. Mm -hmm. um, Pennsylvania um, has had huge struggles with this and they have a pretty big small fruit industry, a lot of grapes and um, they, they, you know, there's a lot going on um, in Pennsylvania. So that's where to our small farmers. Yeah. Oh, totally. yeah. 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 We can, I can, um, that's a problem in a couple of weeks, Molly, I can give you a call and we could sit down and kind of bat around some ideas and stuff. And I do, I agree with Richard. I think it's vitally important that if we know about it to know, um, how, where, and how many trees there are, because there may be like, you know, they might figure out, oh, if you, if you only have in this geographical area, you only have 30 trees, don't do anything versus, mm -hmm. you know, it's like grubs in a lawn. If you yeah. have one square foot and eight or less grubs in that square foot, you don't treat, you know? Right. So, so I do think just knowing where they are and then, you know, if it comes to some public uh, awareness campaign, we're like the public health of trees, you know? <laughs> so a public right. health department, I so would we, think we could come up with some little simple, um, you know, some little simple piece of information and a phone number and, you know, go talk to people, you know, and yeah. they, you know, we couldn't tell them you got to cut your tree down unless the USDA gets involved, which, you know, that is what happened in Worcester with this, with the uh, Asian longhorn beetle. They just went in. Was anyway. it the USDA or, or yeah, um, it, was, it was still in there. It There's was USDA, it was uh, APHIS, uh, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, it was the DCR. You know, as soon as this invasive thing happened, given the, um, the urgency of protecting New England forests, like it was a federal government, you know, thing that happened. So, Take over. yeah. I would suggest that at any point, to think about the fact that we have amazing city councilors. They all seem to have newsletters, they run meetings, it's a ward, on a ward level, you could probably pick up some people who'd be willing to help you. If sure, at I'm any sure. point you wanna scale up what you've been doing, taking people out yeah, and looking, I'd be happy to help you reach out to the wards. Molly, I, I would just add too that I think there's a real hunger for um, sort of tree identification knowledge among, like, I, I think people would love to know like what these public shade trees are. Yeah. All around the city. So to the extent you could fold in the Ilanthus around that initiative. That yes, but I think before doing some kind of public thing, I would want to be clear about like why, like what are we going to do with the information? So we know there's Elanthus. Okay, well, what are you going? People are going to ask. So what are you going to do? <laughs> what are we supposed to do? And I don't. I don't really know. What does it mean? And like, how does it stack up against other priorities that we're juggling? Because we're getting to that a, time of year again where we have to think about priorities. It's a funny situation too because Elanthus itself is an invasive plant. Um, yeah. That's an undesirable one, and yet we're a tree commission. It's sort of in the same category as the Norway maple you know, do we want to get rid of Elanthus just because it's an Elanthus or do we keep it, you know, uh, for how do you balance it out that way also? Yeah, my neighbor has been asking me, you know, do the Norway maple seeds travel around? Is it better to chop it down? Or is the service of shade outweighing the damage it's doing as a tree? Good question. I would say Norway maple, in my, my opinion, I don't think the seeds travel very far because they're pretty heavy. They just fall down. But if it's at the edge of a forest, like if it's, um, you know, near a forest, then it can start to spread into the forest. Would you agree with that, Jen? 
Yeah, I think they just have the thing about Norway maple is is they have um, they super high germination percentage. Right. Like like sugar maples, I think it's like twenty percent of the seeds germinate, or maybe even ten. They just it's also aleopathic in that it's yes, mm-hmm. yeah, they, they, the habitat. Yes, limiting yes. other yeah. species. Right. So it's like right hurting and diversity. Alien. And Alianthus just like makes a gazillion billion seeds. And they fly. Uh, they fly because okay. they're lightweight. Yeah. Yeah. And they'll grow anywhere. Like they'll grow. A tree grows in Brooklyn. That book, that was an Alianthus tree. Yeah. Because it grew in the stinking, you know. Sorry to detour Mark- us on the, yeah. <laughs> but I'm curious Mark- about when you said Norway maple. Yeah. So anyway. Anyway, I will, um, to finish up on this, I will, um, I'll do a little bit more research and try to update and see if there's any new information from Pennsylvania where they're on the forefront and like about what they're doing as far as management. And Rich, you're going to contact that woman at, um, at UMass. Yep, Tony Siminski, I'll send her an email tomorrow. Okay. Um, Thank you very much, Molly. And I'll continue working on the surveys now that I have a, a little more time, I think, hopefully, and a clearer idea of why. And Jen, you were interested in doing surveys after June, right? Yeah, I'll get in touch with you. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Definitely. Yep. All right. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, everyone. So any other business not anticipated by the chair? Um, I did um see a member of who's a longtime friend of mine and a member of the Amherst Commission. And um, would you like she and I to try to figure out a date? for a joint okay. like like a potluck or something we could or is or i don't know what the rules are i don't know we could figure something out can i pull you guys and please do she'll mm-hmm. pull the amherst yeah. commission and we'll try to come up with a date um i know it's so hard in the summer but maybe we can at least get a few of us from each commission together to just talk about what we're doing. And I'll start with the, um, with you, Rich. Okay. All right. Anything else? Anyone else have anything to add? We have one minute left with Marilyn. Well, of course we want to say thank you, Marilyn. Oh yes, we do. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you all. Rich, I'm, I'm looking across the screen here. Deb, Jen, Sue, David, Molly, and the other David. <laughs> I really appreciate the work of the commission, especially being that it's uh, volunteer led um, by so many of us um, and Rich for your tremendous dedicated service to the city over all these years. It's really been an amazing experience, what we've been able to achieve. So it's hard to step off. I really wrestled with it. I was on the fence, but I know that you're going to do good work. Carry on. (laughs) (laughs) Take care of yourself and your family. Yes, Marilyn. Take care of your parents and yourself, uh, most importantly. And your sister and all the best at Kestrel, too. You guys are doing amazing things. Thank you. We have a big celebration tomorrow. Oh, good. And Eva, if any of you want to come, I can sneak you in because I'm the handling registration. (laughs) Where is it? So you're the bouncer, huh? Uh, At Park Hill Orchard from six to eight. It's it's food provided by River Valley Co-op. It's live music by Banished Misfortune. We're going to have a lot of a number of speakers. Anyway, email me. Um, if you want to go, I can get you in. It's free. Thank you for the invite. Don't tell Monica. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Unless she watches this recording. <laughs> no. yeah. um, Keep that out of the minutes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other items not anticipated by the chair? All right. Marilyn, would you make a motion to adjourn the meeting, please? Okay. Um, I'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting. May I have a second? I'll second. All right, we have a second. Any discussion on the motion? No discussion. Well, that that is the end of this 
Urban Forestry Commission meeting. 